Deep Blue Something would be best known for their hit single Breakfast at Tiffany's, and while the song shot the group to fame around the world, their history would be plagued with legal troubles and changing trends. Today, let's take a look at whatever happened to the band Deep Blue Something. Two brothers from Texas, Toby and Todd Pipes, would attend Sam Houston State University together in the late 80s and early 90s. Todd was the eldest of the two, and it was during their time at Sam Houston State that the younger brother Toby wanted to change his major, but the program he wanted wasn't offered at Sam Houston, so he transferred to the University of North Texas in Denton. Once Todd graduated from Sam Houston with an English degree, he would receive a call from his brother who told him how great the music scene in Denton was. For Todd, it presented a great opportunity as his mother was after him to go to graduate school and going to the University of North Texas would let him get that degree and join the music scene with his brother. Keep in mind, this was the spring of 1991, so grunge wasn't yet popular at the time. And initially, Toby and Todd's first musical outfit they would put together leaned in a major electronic direction utilizing keyboards and drum machines, taking inspiration from British groups like EMF, The Stone Roses, and Happy Mondays. Side note guys, I've done a whole video on The Stone Roses, the link is down below. The initial plan was for Todd to front the band while Toby would play keyboards. And as the brothers started to look at booking live gigs, they soon realized that they were an anomaly out of a lot of bands who were playing clubs, and they couldn't just go up on stage with a synthesizer and drum machine. So according to Todd, who told Backstage and Behind the Scenes YouTube channel, out of convenience, the brothers changed their sound to be a more straightforward rock and roll band. Toby, who only played keyboards up until this point, had to learn to play guitar while his brother Todd would front the group and play bass. The brothers would enlist a drummer named John Kirtland, who had played in a band named Love Swing. They wanted to add a rhythm guitar but make it acoustic, and they would end up finding a guitar player in Clay Burgess, who actually lived in the same apartment complex as them. They decided to call their new musical outfit Leper Messiah, not taking their name from the Metallica song, but from a line in the David Bowie song Ziggy Stardust. From it and bassist Todd Pipes would admit to Backstage and Behind the Scenes YouTube channel that because of the band's name, some people at their first several gigs thought they were a Metallica tribute band. Of course, the band's sound was nothing even remotely close, and it was after a few gigs of not wanting to be mistaken for a metal band that they changed their name. Drummer John Kirtland suggested Deep Blue Something, not thinking that would be the name, instead thinking the word something would be replaced with another word. But Todd loved the name and instead of using it for just one song, they used it for their moniker going forward. By this point grunge had taken over and for the band they presented an alternative sound. This approach worked and they were soon selling out shows around Denton. And despite their early success, Todd would tell backstage and behind the scenes that even though they knew that they wanted to be musicians for their career, they had no idea about how to go about marketing themselves. They didn't have band photos, they didn't even have a demo, they didn't have a bio or even a mailing list. Eventually the band started to learn the trick of the trade by talking to other bands in the scene and they would soon turn to a fan of theirs for financial help. They would cut their first album, 11th Song, in 1993, which was put out independently. It was by this time the band's second guitarist Clay Burgess would leave the group and he would be replaced by Kirk Tatum. The band's first album would contain the track Breakfast at Tiffany's. Todd Pipes would recall writing the song for Esquire saying, I wanted to see what I could get away with in a pop song and still have it be easy on the ears. I didn't want to repeat any words in the chorus, which is just criminal. And I had the phrase Breakfast at Tiffany's in my head for quite a while. I took it to the band when I had a spare 15 minutes and we started cranking that thing out. We played it later that night. As for the title of the track, some would think it was inspired by the Audrey Hepburn movie, but it wasn't. It would be another movie of hers named Roman Holiday, but Todd thought Breakfast at Tiffany's would be a better title. The song tells the story of a failing couple who has little to nothing in common, except for both liking the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's. The band's second album, 1994's Home, would be financed by a bank loan who was co-signed by a local club owner and put out on Rainmaker Records. Home would once again contain the track Breakfast at Tiffany's, which started to get airplay on the local Dallas station KDGE. Major label Interscope soon took notice and signed the band, re-releasing Home in June of 1995. Home would peak at number 46 on the Billboard album charts, moving over half a million copies, and Breakfast at Tiffany's would peak at number 5 on the pop charts. The song soon became a massive global hit in both Europe and Asia. The band's record company in England, though, never wanted to release the single in the country, despite the fact that it was a hit all over the world, because at that time a lot of the record charts were dominated by British bands. According to Todd, who told Backstage and Behind the Scenes, it was kids in England who were buying up import German copies that shot the song to number one on the charts. In fact, England was the last country for the song to go number one in. Despite all of the band's newfound success, not everything was going smoothly. Back in 1993, during the band's early days, they reached out to a guy named Louis Bickle Jr. Bickle was a massive fan of the band dating back to when they were Leper Messiah. 
He was convinced that back then the band was going to be huge someday and maybe he could share in a piece of the pie. He eventually befriended them and put up $3,000 of his own money to help them record their debut record. Bickle would offer up the financing while in return, he would get the band to sign an agreement with him in 1993, essentially giving him the rights to all the songs on the band's debut record, 11th, including the song Breakfast at Tiffany's. But not just that, the deal, according to the Dallas Observer, and I quote, called for Bickle, who was doing business as Doberman Records, to receive a percentage of money made from all Deep Blue Something songs, past, present, and future. As the band was touring the world in 1995 and selling hundreds of thousands of albums, Bickle felt resentful. Having made only a few thousand dollars off the band's debut record, he wanted his agreement enforced. He soon went after the band and their label for them reneging on their 1993 agreement. Bickle wanted 5% of the album royalties for their breakout release Home turned over to him. But the band and the label claimed that the contract they signed in 1993 was void because Bickle never lived up to his end of the agreement refusing to give the band an accounting of sales of their debut album, and the label claimed that Bickle was only entitled to get his initial $3,000 investment back, and that was it. The lawsuit was eventually settled out of court. While bands are normally hailed as heroes in their hometown, not everybody back in Denton counted themselves fans of Deep Blue Something. The Dallas Observer would report that while the band was conquering the globe in the mid-90s, some in their hometown of Denton considered them too soft or poppy. After all, Denton was home to a band named Brutal Juice, who released an album named Mutilation Makes Identification Difficult. Another band that was popular locally was the group named Cox, spelled C-A-U-L-K, whose vocalist Aiden Holt started printing shirts that read Deep Blow Someone on their merchandise. While it may have been a publicity stunt, the city of Dallas felt the same way towards the band. Holt would tell the Dallas Observer, I think the Toadies fans were kind of embarrassed that Deep Blue Something was being said in the same sentence as the Toadies, considering they had no relationship whatsoever. Plus with Hagfish, Tripping Daisy, Brutal Juice, The Reverend Horton Heat, there was this whole wave right then, and Deep Blue Something didn't have a space in that. Side note guys, I've covered the Toadies and Tripping Daisy, the links are down below. The lack of love from their hometown did little to hurt the band members' feelings though, with Toby telling the Dallas Observer, when people do that, it almost promotes you. We must be really successful, we must be really big if people are that upset. But it was during the tour to support the group's major label debut that guitarist Kirk Tatum was fired and he turned around and sued the band and received his own settlement. Original guitarist Clay Burgess would rejoin the band. Within a short period of time, the band soon noticed the changing trends in the music business. Todd Pipes would write for Esquire, We went back to Europe to support Halo and Josie from the same record home, but the musical landscape had changed so much. That's when we started getting at odds with the record company. The band would record their follow-up to home, but by this point in time, Interscope was more focused on new metal acts, including Limp Bizkit, and the album was put on the back burner, not seeing a US release, and was only put out in Europe and Japan. Unhappy with their label, Deep Blue Something sued Interscope and successfully got out of their contract and walked away with their masters and some money as well. Todd would reveal what came next writing in Esquire. Toby and I started producing other music and got distracted with more grown-up endeavors. We put out another record referring to their final LP in 2001, but it was just half-hearted. The band never broke up, we just stopped. You always think it's going to be a lifelong thing. When we saw the compromises we'd have to make to maintain that level of fame, we realized we didn't want that, he'd say. The brothers soon purchased a recording studio named Bass Propulsion Laboratories in Dallas, and they would work with some pretty big people in the industry learning their craft, including Prince, Duran Duran, and Avril Lavigne producer David Leonard, in addition to Queen producer Roy Thomas Baker. And one of the first big names to record at their studio would be Drowning Pool. Side note guys, I've done a whole video on the career of Drowning Pool, the link is down below. In addition to owning a recording studio, the brothers would be involved in their own musical projects, with Todd doing some solo work. Then in 2014, the band would finally reform. Todd at the time he was finishing up his second solo album, and in talking with his brother, they threw around the idea of finishing up some Deep Blue Something leftover songs that were never recorded. This would lead to a reunion and the new EP 2015's Locust House. From 2014 onward, the band's been somewhat active on the touring circuit, with their most recent show happening last year. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. We'll see you again on Rock and Roll Stories. Take care.